Marchant has a reputation of one of Boston's most active and vital literary voices. As a poet, translator, organizer, great friend and supporter of Boston's literary community. He's director of the Poetry Center and Creative Writing Program at Suffolk University. He was one of the first officers to be honorably discharged as a conscientious objector in the Vietnam War. He has been a longtime faculty member at the William Joyner Institute for the Study of War and Social Consequences at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. He has taught many workshops nationwide. And he has uh, also done extensive work with veterans of war, both at UMass Boston and across the country as well. Uh, he ha now has five books of published poetry and he is here to share some of his work and some of his insights with you today. So please give a warm welcome to Fred Marchant. You're coming here. All right. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you for those kind words and for reminding my wife, Steffi, and I of uh, December 24th, 2016. It was a very, very cold, snowy day, and downtown Boston had been promised a blizzard, and it was practically empty. And, um, but the mayor wanted the proclamation read on that day. And so what, what he required of Daniel Legorge-Georges, myself, and his assistant is that we meet downtown in Boston uh, at a significant place, namely the Suffolk University building where the Poetry Center is, and, and have Danielle read the proclamation to an audience of my wife, Steffi, and the mayor's assistant, and me. Uh, <laughs> Saying that this, on the other hand, it was a great honor and it was, it was a great gift too. And I can tell you that that for all of that snowstorm, that that proclamation is indeed framed, and all of my relatives are incredibly happy. Uh, I asked for this kind of mic because I, I like I like to move around these days in my um, in my in my readings, and so I'm going to do something a little bit different to begin. But something that says, I think, some, speaks to the whole question of art and what, what this kind of work, both music and poetry, together um, is all about. So, so let me come to the middle. We plotted this out as best we can. And I want you to use your imaginations. You can see in the book that I'm holding, I'm going to read mostly from this relatively recent book, that you can see there's an image in it. There's a, it's actually the left hand. And, um, in real life, it's not much bigger than this. That what what it consists of what what it consists of is the um, is um, it's a clay terracotta votive figure, the kind of thing that that in the ancient world, if you had an illness, you might have made baked and placed at a temple of Asclepius, the god of healing, or if you had been healed, you might have one made and place placed there. And you can't see it because it's really quite tiny, but the poem tells you there's actually some numbers at the bottom. It's in the Vatican Museums, this, this, this image. The left hand. Clay votive offering. Etruria. Third century. B. C. E maybe three inches tall. Forget the museum's numbers on the wrist. Look hard into the open palm instead. Take your time. I'm sorry if I'm if I'm making the microphone jump like that. I apologize for for those for those sounds. I'm not burping. <laughs> in case you were wondering, um, but I have to find my notes now. They disappeared. And I have to remember how my sequence. Um, oh, there they are. Um, <clears throat> this is a book called Said Not Said, and it has in it a variety of longish poems. 
only the longest poems are often broken down into subtitled sections. So let me, let me begin with that spirit of um, taking your time. By taking your time, sorry. <clears throat> I hope I'm okay with the microphone. Does that bother anybody? Yeah, please, because I can hear it. And if I can hear it, you can. Thank you. Good. Already better, right? Good. <laughs> the teacher. They bring before him a woman taken in adultery. He is asked, what is to be done? For by law, her head should be crushed by stones. Trick question, writes the evangelist. A ragged boy watching from behind backs senses danger. While the teacher ignores the question utterly, as if he heard them not. The boy squeezes front to see the teacher bend down and with his finger push aside the sand, waiting for someone to pick up the first stone. The book says nothing as to what the teacher wrote in the sand, or if this was, this was writing at all. Like the boy staring at what looked like chicken scratches, we are left to wonder at the spell, the unsaid casts over them all. We feel unrelenting sunlight bearing down on the accusers. We may try to imagine what they are thinking, but they, convicted by their conscience, have begun to walk away and are saying nothing. Chalk. Neat white sticks and cardboard packets, worn nubs at the end of the school day, the sisters whose swirling habit sleeves swept along the boards picking up dust. When I was the lucky one to clean up, I would bring erasers outside and clap them against the walls and each other. Puffs of chalk dust clouds would rise through the trees, determined to leave. The fine, powdery remains of words, numbers, and solid geometric proofs, complex sentences we diagrammed, vertical lines dividing subject from verb, we turn now to limestone particles, silica, remnants of shells, history and sediments, our flimsy white truths, what I believed in. The rapids. In the dream, I sat down on the far edge of the portico out of the rain and waited for the doors to open. I read a poem with the passing hope it would bring to mind the voice of the one who now was gone. The chapel doors parted, and our ushers in white gloves handed out the program printed on paper made to feel like vellum. I took my place among the others, listened as well as I could to the music and words that flew like pigeons up to the rafters. And I, too, was upstairs, standing in talk that swirled around me like whitewater. Elbows bumped into, the wine spilled on skewered white plugs of scallop wrapped in bacon. I shifted to be nearer the widow who was standing alone in what sounded like rapids roaring. I was proud I could hold steady enough for anyone who might need me. At the same time, I felt an almost overwhelming desire to apologize. Although to whom and for what? I just could not say. Wet gravel. Stone barrow on a point overlooking the sea, a good place to take the last labored breath. Quartz vein, shale, slate layers, depressed sandstone, thin lines we read the epochs in. Rust and gray minerals down rivers in Zion. A bit of brown miracle dirt from Chimayo, the rock a boy threw at my head, the one I picked.
pitch back at him. Nickies, we called them. Cairns, you see climbers build at the summit and mark the trail with on Kilauea caldera. Glacial stones that migrate under the earth or sit as mo unmoved as the Buddha, hard enough to break tines off a backhoe. Prayer stones we place with care and words atop the grave. A white pebble at the bottom of Frost's well. Oh, stone, wrote Nguyen Zui, thinking of lives lost near Angkor. Oh, bloodstones of Mycenae that we sit on while we drink from our water. The backyard stones a child will hammer open to find the unequivocal silence inside of things. The wet gravel paths we turn and face each other on. Those four poems constitute the title poem of the book. That's the said, not said sequence. And if I, not without sort of like explicating my own poem, it's really about all the things that are not said, hiding inside of all the things that are said, hiding like the silence inside the stone at the end of that. Let me do a, let me change the mood every so slightly. It's the next poem, too, right after the sequence, so just so you know. <clears throat> but it is in the spirit of what, um, what is Earth Day month, Earth month, Earth Day week. Um, pear tree in flower. Sometimes a tree will do anything you ask. You must speak to it softly, as carefully as you... I am not kidding. I want you to know that. I, this is a tiny bit of name dropping, but forgive it, because it's so true and nice. Um, that, that was inspired by, do you know what an espalier tree is? You know, the way you can make it actually stand at attention, put its arms out straight? Well, in Maxine Hong Kingston's backyard where I wrote that, there is an espalier pear tree, and it was in flower. And, uh, and so that last little, that interrupted thought and that plea, I'm not kidding, is Maxine's voice. That's exactly how she sounds. I am not kidding. <laughs> However, I also think I'd like to read some more tree poems. So I'm going to read a poem from my first book. And it, interestingly enough, it has its roots, all puns intended, um, it has its roots in um, the same place that the poem that I just read does, not Maxine's backyard. But that poem ha begins with the same word that this poem begins with. And that word is actually something that I noticed a long time ago in William Stafford's poetry. And William Stafford was a teacher of mine. And he was also the great mentor of Naomi Shihab Nye. And, um, and so um, when, when Cheryl mentioned and reminded us that it was Earth Day this week and so forth, um, I, was, I remembered, oh, yeah, I do want to read this poem. So this is called Bristle Code. And it's about the bristlecone pine tree, which is one of the oldest living organisms on the earth. Some, they say, are as old as 10,000 years. And they live on the edge of canyons in the far west. And they look mostly dead, except for a little green at the end of what looked like driftwood. And all that dead with driftwood around it is actually protection against the incessant lightning strikes that happen. And so this bristlecone pine tree is on the edge of a canyon in Utah. And the first word um, in that poem and this poem, that I, the one I just read of this one, owes much to William Stafford. Russell Cone. <clears throat> Sometimes a tree will be there when you need it most. When you realize that you've been breathing too long in the high, thinned out air. Maybe you've staggered, tripped on a rock, you warned yourself about, but tripped on anyway. Marmots may be signaling your coming, and you could answer with your own set of clicks and whistles, but all this would only deepen the dizziness, the spin of nausea, the dread combining with delight at reaching the rim of the canyon. Below, the rock shapes waver, and you are not the first to think they look like the dead. You want to run after them, to tug and plead. The feeling as it rises 
has its own strong winds. You know that lightning and rain will be coming. You stand in one of the eroded places, seeking out that tree. Because of my long association with the William Joyner Institute for the Study of War and Social Consequences, I've really been privileged as, um, you know, I came of age as a writer in my 40s, late 40s, if you will, mid anyway. And the Joyner Center was, I've been with them ever since, uh, every summer teaching, but also um, participating in the broader activities of the Joyner Institute. And one of those things was an ongoing translation project. I don't speak Vietnamese but I have Vietnamese friends who do, and I have some grasp of the language. And there were, many, there were a number of delegations from the Joyner Institute to modern day Vietnam, and, which, and then Vietnamese writers would come to this country and spend two, three, four weeks at the Joyner Institute. So there were many friendships made. One is with, and I've included this translation in Said Not Said, one, is, one of my friends is a man named Bo Quê, who's most of the time a songwriter and singer and musician, but you know, after all, we are closely related, songwriters, singers, musicians, and poets. And, and I, he has a place in this book for a lot of reasons. Um, um, but I want to tell you that, that this, this short poem is, um, is as close to a song as I can probably get. It's called The Peach. It's by Vo Kue, and it's co-translated by Nguyen Ba Chung, my dear friend, and myself. Overnight, a bat has eaten half the peach. The rest has fallen onto the sad, sad earth. For you, I leave a portion of happiness. Me, I shall keep my share of the sorrow. So, I said, so I know Bo Kui well. He's a dashing sort of fellow, and I'm sure he's had many romances that ended. <laughs> and he says this is a love poem, and I think he's no doubt true. But it, whenever I think of that poem, and when I read it certainly out loud, I also think of it as a post-war poem. It is the other side of the war, you know, and how brilliantly combined um, uh, those feelings are. Uh, in that work. Okay, I'm going to um, read now another sequence poem. And it's, um, it arises out of the same sort of work. It, it, it recounts a journey, a pilgrimage really, in Vietnam, a delegation from the Joyner Center and a delegation of some international writers at a conference in Hanoi. We came from the conference down to the middle of the country. I look out and I hope some of you know the middle of the country is where the then DMZ was, right? So at the top of the middle of the country is Route 9, and it goes from the coast into, across the country to Laos. And that was the, ter- the scene of terrible fighting and, de- and de- death. And um, the delegation, the international delegation, was making a, a visit to the national cemeteries along Route 9, and uh, including also the, um, the former American military combat bases. And one most famous one is at, at the Laotian border, Khaesan, for those of you who are of this age. And so this is an elegy. And the province in which Route 9 is the Quang Tri, or Quang Chi province. It's the Quang Chi elegy. I am pretty sure that I would have died here maybe in the rain that comes down to pick at the old red clay road snaking upward. I am pretty sure I would have killed here or wanted to, had to, tried to, not meant to, with no God and very few others to forgive me. I bow over the gravestones, and the burning sticks bow with me. My spine, 
all my pliable inner organs bowing with a sorrow I barely know I have, but which a honeyed, musky joss calls out of me, a smoke dragon rising before which all I am bows, then bows again. On the road into the mountains, mist clings to the trees, wraps its arms around the rows of gravestones. I ask what nights were like, what lights shone in the valleys, what smoke rose from cooking fires, what whispers you listened for in the words that you did not understand. At Quezon, in the small museum on stilts, glass cases keep the rifles, packs, jungle boots, on the walls, many framed photos of the siege. Beside me, a friend from Hanoi leans in to find himself in the pictures, searching, as in the koan, for the face he had before his parents were born. On the bus ride back down from Lao Bao, I see children in a corner of the yard and wonder if they have heard the story of the dead who come down to the river at night to bathe who edge out on the mossy rocks and let the fast water wash over what they are. It is said they listen to crickets sing, the wind murmur, a listening as deep and real as breathing. They scrub their hands, they splash their cheeks and steady each other in the water. These shades the stream rushes toward, eager to give them back their flesh unharmed their mother's own. It's another, this is another elegy. Excuse me, that was a burp. <laughs> it's an elegy for Seamus Heaney. <clears throat> and there's an epigraph from the great Brazilian Portuguese poet, Adelia Prado. The epigraph is, the soul, yes, was murky. And no one could see it. The poem is called Fennel. Something of the fog is burned off, something in the high oaks, and behind the sounds of hammers, ignitions, a shift outward, a quick, long view to a sliver of the largest bay there is. A morning of pinion and stridor. Of course, you were not one who was for the high air and only remote. You were for the light on the table, the red gate that needed to be shut, the irritable dog that hears the world too much, the scruffy, fledgling robin that lands on the trellis, sizes me up in the way of its kind and decides, I'm all right, just more evidence of oddity found among the breathing. <clears throat> At the end, maybe you were thinking of Whitman and his claim that dying was luckier than we had supposed, or not, or not. Here is the bee that hovers over a newly fallen leaf. How lovely the flower, I do not know. And where, where do I enter? I remember cresting the ancient hill at Dunkinelli, seeing a blue caravan in the pasture corner and thinking, this is all I will ever know of the soul. The grass uncut, a land arm stretching out to the south. I touch it again here, in the braille of a small yellow bloom I rub between my fingers and pass under my nose, while a snail with its horns of light works its way down the stem. In a few minutes I'm going to end, but there will be also a, a few more minutes for some Q&A. So if there's anything in that poem, or the earlier ones that you know, we should talk about, it's okay. We should talk about it. 
I'm going to end. Um, there's another longest suite of poems in this book. Actually, it's the opening suite. And it's, there, it's a sort of long-ish elegy for my sister, who, um, um, when she was growing up, was an aspiring painter. And the sad truth is, is that in her 20s, she developed a schizophrenia that did not go away and spent the rest of her life in that struggle uh, to survive. And um, she, was, she was the only image of art in my growing up, if you will. Um, and so I want to read a couple of poems to end, um, you know, sort of in her honor, if you will. Um, a short one. And I can show you this. You can see the two columns. You can see why the layout is important. Twin tulips. I ran a finger down her stilt-like stems and over pale green petals, my sister's watercolor, the paint weeping down the page she was trying to hold on to as long as, as long as. part of a long sequence about her last days. The last part is called Her. Her last day on the planet she thrashed and spit while the nurses tied her wrists to the bed rail with strips of cloth that only worsened what was happening. Her face was radiant, her whole being flush from the long struggle with those she knew she should never have trusted. They tried to keep track of her vitals charted her erratic heart, peered into her cranium with a flashlight through the eyes. She said they had taped a death line to the port in her arm. They said she should believe in a plastic tube at her nose that would fill her lungs with good clean air. She shook her head as hard as she could, cut her whole body to say, nope, thou shalt not, no way, nothing doing, thou shalt not touch me. Not with the elbow bendable straw adjusted to the lips. Not with the insidious needle pointed upward and dribbling over. And absolutely not with that wheezing apparatus of the unacceptable the big attendant was reeling in.